Welcome to our midweek Bible study in the Our Perfect Love series. This is the fourth and our final week. And I want to especially welcome those of you who are joining me today for this study. This is, in my book, this chapter called Sparks from the Fire, Chapter 4 of Marjorie Sue Hockey's uh, Theological Reflection on John Wesley's Work, along with the material from John Wesley himself, is some of the most inspiring material in the, in the entire book. Its suggestions and its thoughts just really soar into the heart of God, I feel. And if there is one part of this book that is absolutely worth a reading, not only during this season of Lent, but I would say every season of Lent, it would be this part. In fact, I'm going to share just a few of the thoughts that John Wesley shared with us in uh, in the readings that we had for today. I highly encourage you, if you have not already read the material, to pick up your reading guide and read through the material that's, that's suggested for this week because it will really bring a lot of uh, illuminating light to the discussion that uh, the questions we have for today bring forth. Just some of these wonderful thoughts of John Wesley's for this week. To abandon everything, to strip oneself bare in order to seek and to follow Jesus Christ naked to Bethlehem where he was born, naked to the hall where he was scourged, and naked to Calvary where he died on the cross, is so great a mystery that both the will to do it and the knowledge of it is given to anyone only through faith in the Son of God. What a wonderful thought, especially for this season of Lent as we are approaching the cross of Holy Week. Some of the thoughts that he shares with us in these writings from this, uh, this segment of his book, A Plain Account of Christian Perfection, are really, uh, they test us. One of these thoughts is this, tolerating others and suffering evils in meekness and silence is the sum of the Christian life. And he says we should especially practice our love toward those who most shock either our way of thinking, our temperament, our knowledge, or the desire we have that others should be as virtuous as we wish to be ourselves. Here's a especially poignant thought, I believe, for these anxious times that we are living in. He says God does nothing but an answer to prayer. Even the people who have been converted to God without praying for it themselves, which is extremely rare, he adds in parentheses, were prayed for by others. Every new victory that a soul gains is the effect of a new prayer. And he writes, whenever we experience anxiety, we should steep ourselves in prayer. In those times, we need to open our hearts and minds to the grace and light of God. Only then will we be prepared to make decisions in accord with God's will, without concern for any success or failure that they may bring. Here's another good thought for Lenten disciplines. He writes, It is good to renew ourselves from time to time by thorough self-examination of the state of our soul as if we have never examined it before. Nothing contributes more to the full assurance of faith than keeping ourselves in humility and the exercise of all good works. Uh, for those of you who have your books nearby, that's found on page 84 in section 7. And I like this one too in section 8 on page 85. He says, one of the cardinal rules of religion is to lose no opportunity to serve God. Of course, we heard more from that last week in his advice about being aware of the sin of omission. And he says here, because God cannot be seen, we are to serve God in our neighbor. God receives such service as if it were done to God in person, person standing visibly before us. So those are just some of the most wonderful thoughts that John has for us in this segment of his work, A Plain Account of Christian Perfection.
And I'm going to begin today by reading a scripture for us from Philippians 4, and this is verse 4, and I'll be reading through verse 7. Chapter 4 of Philippians, verse 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I want to invite us to begin today with a word of prayer. Will you join me? We are grateful, most holy God, that you are always calling to us, inviting us to respond to you through our thoughts and our words and actions. Open our hearts and minds to you in this time that we might be fully attentive to your grace and receptive to your love that seeks us even as we study and discuss these readings today. Fill us and challenge us to respond with a renewed spirit that we might be a part of your new creation in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we begin today, as I did last week, I will be posting on the screen before you several of the discussion questions that are part of this week's study guide. You most likely, unless you've downloaded it, do not have access to the uh, pick questions on paper. But I do encourage you to pause the video as they are on the screen so that you can read them again, digest them, have some discussion if there are others around with you having a watch party, or just have some time to reflect on them and maybe journal in response to them. This week's readings focus on prayer. How do you define and describe prayer? What questions do you have about prayer? This study about prayer, these materials that John Wesley has given to us, uh, some insight into his own prayer life, are so rich. It would be very profitable to have a session of our weekly Bible study just to uh, process some of these questions and our answers to them in a group session, something that we can't do uh, interactively right now. But maybe take some time to write down your answers and your questions. What questions do you have about prayer? And the next question, how has your prayer life grown and changed over your lifetime as a Christian? What's gotten easier? What has become more challenging? I know for me, as an introvert, one of the more challenging things about praying was praying out loud, especially with a group of people, maybe even praying with another person. But over time, God has worked in my heart and by through his transforming love he has empowered me and given the, me the ability to be courageous and pray to offer to pray in times that previously I wouldn't have and I think one thing that God has strengthened in my convictions is the need for ongoing prayer especially for those who I seek a particular healing whether it be salvation, healing from a disease. John Wesley really speaks heavily to that in this particular writing. Prayer and the life of constant prayer are defined in several ways in this particular section of, uh, of his writings. And the chapter title that Marjorie Suhaki gave to chapter 4 is uh, sparks of prayer. That's how she describes each of these different uh, functions, if you will, of prayer. Some of those that uh, John mentions, prayer is participation in God's creative power. 
That's she talks more about that in pages 135 through 138. Prayer, and this is a little shocking, but John mentions that prayer is bearing the faults of others. Prayer unceasing is very important. As you look at these, what are the least familiar? What are the ones that are least comfortable to you? I know for myself, thinking about bearing the concerns, the weaknesses of others, the faults of others, in my own confessional prayers, that is a, that's a new concept to me. One that I'll be looking to incorporate into my prayer life. What sparks, what functions of prayer help you think about prayer in new and challenging ways? Marjorie Suhaki writes, Prayer opens us to God's calling. Insofar as we respond to those calls, channels are opened through which God's creative grace pours. And when we pray, the creative grace of God pours through us to do what God can do now, that we are open to the work of God. How does prayer help us to grow in perfect love toward God and others? How can it help us to see new creative possibilities? One of the very important thoughts that Wesley writes in this section is, Although all the graces of God depend on God's abundance, God is generally pleased to attach them to the prayers, the teaching, and the holiness of those whom God gives to be our examples in faith. By strong, though invisible attractions, God draws some souls through their relationships with others. That brings up a good question. Who has God placed in your life who's been an example of faith and helped you to draw close to God in Christian perfection, Christian love? Who is God encouraging you to be an example of faith to? What do you need to do to help them draw close to God? I can imagine as we look back upon our lives, we can think of many brothers and sisters in our church and in other settings, neighbors perhaps, maybe co-workers, who have been those ones that God placed in our lives to have a very important role. Many in our culture today experience discouragement, anxiety, and struggle with the question of suffering in our world and in their lives. We're wondering about what's going on with this virus that's spreading all around us and seems to be uh, embracing us with its tentacles. What an appropriate section to be reading of John Wesley's works. And as you reflect on your own struggles and those of others in these areas, how do you respond to these words of Wesley? These will be on the screen. He writes, True surrender is a complete conformity to the whole will of God who wills and does all except sin that comes to pass in the world. In order to do this, we have only to embrace all events, good and bad, as God's will. We are to bear with those we cannot change and be content with offering them to God. This is true surrender. Because Christ has borne our infirmities, we may well bear those of one another for Christ's sake. Wow. That, that thought has a lot to challenge us.
especially in regards to accepting all things, good and bad, as God's will. Certainly in discussion, I can imagine we would have some lively back and forth around that thought. And at any time, I encourage you to pause the video and have your own discussion, have your own wrestling in your mind and your spirit about some of what Wesley's saying here. Wesley writes about the relationship of perfect love and good works, stating that the love of God is the beginning and the end of all our good works. That's on page 86 of our book. How is prayer a part of this relationship of love and good works? How does prayer energize us for good works and keep us from pride and works righteousness? Works righteousness being the idea that we're earning our righteousness through our work that we're doing. Wesley alludes to more about that in his writings. On page 86, Wesley shares a summary of his suppositions about Christian perfection. They are uh, a little lengthy, and so I won't uh, have a screen to show you of them, but I will refer you to page 86 and those 11 points you find there. And I encourage you to reflect upon them and think about which one helps you the most to clarify what Christian perfection is. And which one speaks to you at this point on your Christian faith journey? Marjorie writes, Our prayers offered in the name of Christ unite us as one body. Prayer is not just private, but must also be corporate. And corporate prayers foster spiritual growth for both the individuals and as the society as a whole and therefore for the society's influence and work in the world. Spiritual growth is, of course, always connectional. It relates to us more deeply toward one another in love and binds us in loving action toward those beyond our circles. And this leads to the question, in a time when our nation and our church are highly divided, how can corporate prayer be a means of grace that binds us together in perfect love. What are the petitions that we might lift up in our corporate prayers as a gathered body of faith that will help us to see new creative solutions to live together as the unified body of Christ? As we close this session of our Bible study, I want to thank you for joining me. I pray that you have found this uh, reflection time with John Wesley to be a fruitful one. I pray that you found this series to be one that's uh, given us lots to think about in regards to growing in Christian perfection. And as we close today, I want to close with a, a word of affirmation and a prayer using the words of John Wesley. Let's join together in prayer. Gracious Lord, together we are your family. Fellow laborers in the vineyard of you, our companions in the kingdom and patience of Jesus. Although this we confess, if we're fools for Christ, yet as fools bear with us, we do expect to love God with all of our heart and our neighbor as ourselves. Indeed, we do believe that God will in this world so cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that we shall perfectly love God and worthily magnify God's holy name. Amen. If you missed last week's Bible study, it's available on demand. You can find it on our Facebook page uh, below this particular link, or perhaps we can email that to you. And I invite you to be back next Wednesday when once again we'll post another Bible study session for discussion and reflection. Join us then. Thanks.